Betsy Stapleton and we're sitting here at my ranch. I have about 60 acres with my husband in the hay field there. We're a couple weeks out from harvesting and putting up enough hay to feed our cows and horses for the year. My husband grew up in a, a ranching community and ranching family in Nebraska and then uh, joined the military and ended up getting a college education in natural resources but ended up being a civil engineer and I was a nurse practitioner. When we retired, we moved to uh, Siskiyou County, so that was a very big change for us to experience um, summers here where it gets very hot and very dry. We bought this piece of property because there's a year-round creek in it. One of the interesting things that we discovered about our property was that it had beavers as well as all these fish. The beaver sign was very sparse when we first bought the property and it was severely overgrazed, but all the um, shrubs and um, willow species that the beavers really eat and thrive on were very, very minimal. And so one of our first restoration actions was simply um, fencing the riparian area. And we believe that the beaver population has expanded uh, significantly as a result. The thing that is driving the cultural change around acceptance of beavers here with the agricultural interest is the fact that there is tremendous amount of water storage behind beaver dams. When this dam was functional, the water was, you know, the, when I stepped down in there, it was, but it was up to here on me. And you can see the results even this next season with the very luxuriant uh, riparian vegetation there. 2014 and 2015 were extreme drought here. Large sections of the river and um, creeks started drying up and what people noticed was that where there were beavers that were able to make effective beaver dams that's where there was residual pools of water and uh, residual stream flow. Noticing that where beaver activity w was was where there was water was really the key point where where the general community started getting interested in beaver associated restoration. At the same time, it became clear that there was going to start being regulation around utilization of groundwater. So a group of local ranchers got together and started um, thinking about how to address groundwater use. As part of that, a researcher from NOAA came down and started talking to them about the potential for beavers to uh, significantly recharge groundwater and address uh, the agricultural need for water and address the pending regulatory obligations that the uh, ranchers would be under. And this um, just opened up people's eyes. So as I mentioned, we have beavers on this property that we're on, but they never really built effective dams. People called them, ah, oh, they're banky beavers, they're a different kind of beavers. But as I started learning more and more about it, the um, inability of beavers to effectively construct, construct dams are a result of people pushing uh, creeks and rivers into narrow channels, um, building uh, dams and dikes along them so the water doesn't spread out. In historic times, creeks and rivers were, were at the level of the floodplains. And when high flows came up, the intensity and velocity and force of the water was dispersed. Whereas if you have a beaver dam that's flowing through a narrow channel and water comes up, it's just going to wash it out. In addition, watersheds used to have huge numbers of large uh, trees that would fall in. And these would provide structural anchor points for beaver dams. So that kind of leads around to the next level of working with beavers, the restoration tools, where you actually um, put some anchor posts in the creek so that the beavers have material that they can start using to make their dams a lot more solid. And so that's a strategy that we're starting to deploy here on my property and across the valley. Since beavers have been um, being tolerated more and more dams have gone in in some critical locations, some of the large um, agricultural um, producers in the area have actually noticed some decreases in their um, pumping costs because of the elevation of groundwater associated with the uh, beaver dams. And let me tell you, that can be a big motivator to, su to uh, support beavers on your property. 
there are people that are easily paying $1,000 a day in pump costs to be able to um, sprinkle their property and produce hay. And so reducing that by any percentage really makes a difference in terms of their bottom line. So it, this has very practical and quantifiable benefits for uh, people who uh, uh, are dependent on the natural resources for their livelihood. There is a place in the valley where beaver dam analogs have been installed now four or five years ago. In 2015, beavers moved in because there was water. They've turned them into completely natural structures. There's now um, organic material, leaves drop in, and instead of being carried out to the ocean, they stay on the bottom. The bugs come in, um, and fish can grow there and thrive. We uh, raised several thousand coho salmon and um, similarly several thousand steelhead in that area too. The beavers keep extending the area. Last year we had, I think, estimated about three acres of prime coho habitat. We estimated that we raised um, somewhere in the vicinity of um, five to six thousand coho. The Watershed Council started their um, beaver associated restoration by uh, assisting landowners with dealing with problems that beavers cause. I have um, an irrigation ditch that trans, uh, transects my property and carries water to another uh, property owner and the beavers started building their dams in that ditch. They also started plugging up a culvert going under the road and I can tell you my um, compassion and understanding for the difficulty of managing living with beaver went up dramatically when it was my problem. So providing an active outreach effort to landowners that acknowledges the realistic difficulties of living with beavers rather than just saying, oh no, it's easy to do. It is hard work. The Watershed Council has gone out and caged trees um, for landowners. Um, we have a landowner that um, <clears throat> had a very beautiful big beaver dam complex on their property and they loved it, but then the water started extending too far onto their pasture, so we put in uh, a water level control device. Um, in other instances, we have put up the, the um, culvert protection devices. We're starting to try and evaluate what if there was a thousand beaver dams across the whole valley? How much water would we be able to retain on the landscape? How much um, agriculture could we support while at the same time having water in streams for fish rather than it being a, um, you know, someone wins, someone's lose. My vision for the future here in Beaver Valley is not that we return it to complete wetland from, from edge to edge. That's not a realistic vision. People live here, people have ranches, but what is possible is greatly expanding the amount of wetlands that are on the landscape. The old timers here remember a time when people were able to fish in the creeks and river, and that's been the river dries, there aren't fish. And even if the river had a little trickle, we're not allowed to fish anymore because these fish are endangered. My vision is that there's beavers, beavers dams, cultural support for expanding wetlands across the landscape in areas that are appropriate to the point where old timers can take their grandkids out and return to that experience of fishing together out there, um, one generation sharing, sharing this incredible landscape that we're privileged to be given to take care of.
is Travis Hedrick. I'm a fisheries technician with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is my second year out here. I was out here last season as well. You know, coming up last year was my first year to this year, I do see a lot a lot of changes in the beaver habitat. You know, there's lodges that were, are here this year that weren't there last year, and vice versa. This right here, yeah, um, it used to have a beaver dam. Um, it looks like it got blown out, but it's still the river. Those beavers changed it so much that the water, there's um, vegetation on the bottom with the, when the main river has just gravel. So um, this is right here, it's perfect habitat for juveniles. So juvenile salmon, juvenile salmon like to come up in here in this, uh, in this back, now it's a back channel uh, and spend their summers here. Beavers and fish have uh, done this dance but for an awful long time and uh, sometimes fish may be able to spawn in a stream and other times they may not. You know, you can't make all of Alaska's waterways be favorable for salmon, for example, or be favorable for cohos, or be favorable for whitefish. The diversity of habitats in amongst the wild river systems uh, is a good thing. It just flat out is. In some areas we'll promote some species, in some areas we'll promote others. And so uh, uh, beaver dams are just part of the landscape and they've always been there. Uh, for as long as, as we know of history up here, and uh, they always will. A lot of the beavers here on the Queethlook are uh, what we call river beavers, where they don't even make dams, and they just live on alongside the river. Beaver dams pretty much primarily benefit the juvenile, juvenile salmon within the river. Um, we create a safe place for them. No predators like uh, Dolly Varden or rainbow trout, especially here on the Queethlick. Um, there's a lot of things trying to eat them. And so beaver, beaver ponds are a perfect nursery for them. They've been here on the Queethlick in these upper, upper river tributaries for quite a while. And uh, sometimes they'll, they'll hinder a side channel or slough or sockeye and chum and king salmon like to spawn, but the salmon are so resilient that they'll, they'll find new areas and these rivers change constantly. And so every, every summer, there's always new habitat being made by these rivers. A lot of people see these beaver dams um, as a hindrance because they see whitefish um, blocked upstream of, this, of the beaver dam and they believe that they can't get out, which can be true. Sometimes the fall floods aren't high enough to to, create, to blow out a beaver dam or to create a channel in the beaver dam where the fish could go out. So it's just nature pretty much to make sure it's to live or die. How do beaver dams differ from the dams that we build? <laughs> beaver dams differ immensely from man-made dams. The comparison between beaver dams and man-made dams is not a comparison at all. They're two different, you know, they're two, it's, it's like mixing apples and oranges. <laughs> you can't compare them. Beaver dams and man-made dams are two very, very different structures. All of these forms of uh, dams that people build are really impenetrable unless they provide a way for fish to get through. Whereas beaver dams, they're permeable. Uh, there's water that goes through and uh, these fish work their way through it. It, looks, it may look to us like there's no way through, but uh, these fish get through. Beaver dams are so variable that even from one year to the next, a beaver dam might not be in the same place and it might get blown out and within a year or two, you won't, e you won't even know that there was a beaver dam there.